I'm Charles, and I'm on a mission to find what's inside everything. To help me get my answers, I have an industrial CT scan. It takes a whole bunch of x-ray images from all around a subject, and then builds a 3D model, revealing every internal detail. Today, we're looking inside of a modern lithium-ion drill battery and its forefather, a nickel-metal hydride drill battery. Let's see how they stack up. Since 2005, almost all cordless hand tools have been sold with lithium-ion batteries. They outperform their nickel-based ancestors in almost every way. Energy density, power density, and resilience. Although they do have some shortcomings in safety and durability, but proper mechanical and electronic design can take care of that. Before we had lithium-ion, though, we had nickel-metal hydride. But nowadays, everyone wants lithium-ion. So, what's the difference between these two? And what makes a good lithium-ion battery? And while we're at it, why are these so darn expensive? We've got our new and old drill batteries. Now, this isn't a matter of Team Red versus Team Yellow. This is just a matter of the tech. This is from, I don't know, 2005, 2007. This is from this last year. I wanna see what the difference is on the inside. So let's look at old first. And the first thing that stands out to me, there's actually another cell tucked up in the stem here. I don't know why I didn't expect that. That just feels silly. We've got our little bonus cell here, and that brings us to a total of 15 cells in this pack. Nickel metal hydride is 1.2 volts nominal per cell. That brings us up to a total pack voltage of, of course, 18 volts, like it says on the side. On top of that bonus cell is where we actually have our contacts, and there's only three contacts, which is going to be battery positive, battery negative, and a secret third thing. Let's figure out what that secret third thing is, and while we're at it, let's figure out where those wires actually go. Right off the hop, we can see where one of those wires goes, and it doesn't go far. This terminal just goes directly onto the battery cell beneath it. Yeah, why not? Good spot for it. Our secret third terminal, and things become shockingly hazy in the scan. And I think that's because nickel, fairly heavy element compared to lithium. So our secret third terminal kind of disappears. But the reason it kind of disappears is because it's actually soldered right in here onto this tiny weeny little wire which disappears into a shadow and then ducks down into a pocket right in the middle. And it's going down into the pocket in the middle here. Why there? Well, that's a pretty good spot to put a thermal device in just the most shielded, hottest spot in the entire battery pack. Just to ensure that, well, it reflects how hot the device is getting. And there's even a little plastic tab molded into the case that that thermal protection can be attached to. All these cells are going to be chained directly in series. And then we're going to pick up from probably this cell and run out to our wire, and that's going to go up to form the terminal. Other than that, there are no electronics in this entire pack. None. There's a thermistor, and that's it. Because if we switch to our modern lithium battery, holy crap, would you look at that, there's a full-ass computer in here. Now this has a different cell layout. Instead of having 15 battery cells in here, this only has 10. And those 10 are actually wired in a series parallel configuration. So for a total of about 21 volts when fully charged, because each cell is 4.2 volts at full charge. Now the nominal voltage is like 3.8 or something, which um, is only 19 volts. Milwaukee calls it M18, DeWalt calls it uh, 20 max. I think. But what's important is that we have a lighter battery, a smaller battery, and still a higher voltage. That means it's easier to deliver energy. What's all this other stuff on top? Well, for a start, let's look at the connection. This connection from the battery to the tool, on our old school batteries, there are three pins. Positive, negative, and thermal protection. On here, there's 10. Well, first and foremost, these outer groups are just delivering current. Those are hooked up directly across the leads of the battery, and they let you get an ungodly amount of power out of here. Now, curiously, this blade style of contact is actually just a lot nicer to work with than this style of contact. I think almost all brands, except for Ryobi, when they switched to lithium batteries, moved from this style to this style just so that they could get better energy delivery. Remember how I said the outer two contacts go directly to the battery? Well, you can really see that borne out here because this is the circuit board trace all the way across the length of the battery, bends through this dog leg, and then it's welded to this plate where we start entering the actual cells of the battery pack. So that's carrying current from the one end. Then we, of course, 
daisy chain across the other side, and finally emerge in this corner. We go essentially straight into this connector. All there is in between is a bit of copper and what I really want to believe is a fuse. So if we pull this into a cross section, we can actually see a bit more clearly. Here, we can start seeing the connections being made between our battery cell tabs over here and our output pin. And those tabs are shockingly thin. I think that's because this, in the event of an emergency, is supposed to melt and blow up before the cells catch fire. And a fuse, very good thing to have because these things really do not like being on fire. The other crucial detail to making sure your battery doesn't catch fire is to make sure that the cells are balanced. With nickel metal hydride, you could kind of just keep shoving charge in and the cells would get hot, but they would all eventually wind up stabilizing at the same level. With lithium ion, you cannot do that. <laughs> it's very bad if you don't balance the cells actively while charging them. This circuit board on the inside is actually equipped to individually monitor the voltage of every cell. There is a microcontroller here that's specifically going to be able to do that. You need to have an electrical connection to every cell. Sure enough, even in spots where we don't really need that much meat to do this, you can see all the tabs going to all the cells individually. And those tabs, well, they all go to a solder point somewhere on the circuit board so that they can be individually monitored and tracked by the system. Now on top of that for protection, you also need to be able to tell if this battery is about to burst into flames from over discharge. Easy way to do that, just see what temperature it is. Things that are about to catch fire tend to be hot. You can take that one to the bank. The lithium ion battery is way more complicated than its great grandpa here. This thing has a full computer inside of it, charging and balancing circuits, digital communication, a readout of the voltage, and balanced cells. Thank God for balanced cells. I'm glad we've moved on to these, and I hope you've learned something about how these are put together and what makes them tick. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to leave us a like. And if you want to see inside of something, leave a comment with your suggestion. If you want to support the channel, share this video with a friend, or check out hacksmith.store. And if you want to see inside of everything, get subscribed.